I don't think that most people realize just how important how we breathe is to our quality of life. And that includes our mental health, our physical health, and what we call performance. That is our ability to tap into skills, either physical or cognitive, in ways that we would not be able to otherwise if we are not breathing correctly. So today we are going to talk about what it is to breathe correctly, both at rest, during sleep, in order to reduce our levels of stress. In fact, one simple test of whether or not you can be an efficient nasal breather and whether or not you've been nasal breathing efficiently or most of the time in the past or whether or not you've been relying more on mouth breathing is So when we go to sleep at night, we continue to breathe. That's no surprise. If we didn't, we would die during sleep. However, there is a large fraction of the population that under breathes during sleep. They're not taking deep enough or frequent enough breaths. And therefore they are experiencing what's called sleep apnea. They are becoming hypoxic, hypoxic. There's less oxygen being brought into their system than is necessary. People that are carrying excess weight, either fat weight or muscle weight or both, are more prone to nighttime sleep apnea. However, there are a lot of people who are not overweight who also experience sleep apnea. How do you know if you're experiencing sleep apnea? Well, first of all, excessive daytime sleepiness and excessive daytime anxiety combined with daytime sleepiness is one sign that you might be suffering from sleep apnea. The other thing is if you happen to snore, it's very likely that you are experiencing sleep apnea. And I should mention that sleep apnea is a very serious health concern. It greatly increases the probability of a cardiovascular event, heart attack, stroke. It is a precursor or sometimes the direct cause of sexual dysfunction in males and females, cognitive dysfunction during the daytime. It can exacerbate the effects of dementia, whether or not it's age-related dementia of the normal sort or Alzheimer's type dementia, which is an acceleration of age-related cognitive decline. If you're somebody who's had a traumatic brain injury, if you're experiencing a lot of stress, sleep apnea is going to greatly disrupt the amount of oxygen brought into your brain and body during sleep and is going to lead to a number of nighttime and daytime issues. So it's something that really needs to be addressed and we'll get into this a bit more later, but since I raised it as a problem, I do wanna raise the solution. One of the major treatments for sleep apnea is that people will get a CPAP device, which is this, um, face mask and a machine that they'll sleep with. And while those can be very effective, not everyone needs a CPAP. One of the more common methods nowadays that's being used to treat sleep apnea, which is purely behavioral and intervention and is essentially zero cost is that people are starting to shift deliberately to nasal breathing during sleep because of the additional resistance of nasal breathing. And because of the fact that there's far less tendency, if any, if any, excuse me, to snore when nasal breathing, putting medical tape on the mouth prior to going to sleep and then sleeping all night with medical tape on the mouth is one way that people can learn to nasal breathe during sleep and can greatly offset a lot of sleep apnea, snoring and sleep related issues. A number of people don't want to or don't feel safe putting medical tape on their mouth prior to sleep. For some reason, they think they're gonna suffocate, but of course you would wake up if you started to run out of air um, at any moment. So that's not so much a concern. But what they'll do is they will start to use pure nasal breathing during any type of exercise or even just for some period of time walking during the day or while working. And again, later we'll get into the enormous benefits of shifting to pure nasal breathing when not exercising hard, meaning at a rate that you could normally hold a conversation, although if you're pure nasal breathing, you won't be holding that conversation, or when simply doing work or um, any number of things that are sort of, of low intensity, you can train your system to become a better nasal breather during the daytime through these deliberate actions of taping the mouth shut or just being conscious of keeping your mouth shut. And that, in addition to having a number of positive health and aesthetic effects during the daytime, is known to also transfer to nighttime breathing patterns and allow people to become nasal breathers as opposed to mouth breathers during sleep and to snore less and to have less sleep apnea. Again, if you have severe sleep apnea, you probably do need to check out a, a, sleep, a CPAP. You should talk to your physician. But for people who have minor sleep apnea or sleep apnea that's starting to take hold, uh, these other methods of shifting to becoming a nasal breather are going to be far more beneficial and far more cost effective than going all the way to the CPAP, which by the way, doesn't really teach you how to breathe properly as much as it does adjust the airflow going into your system. That's an important point that when you shift from mouth to nasal breathing during sleep, you're actually learning and training your system to breathe properly. 
Now, with all of that said, I haven't yet really talked about mouth versus nasal breathing. And it really can be a fairly short discussion because what abundant data now show and has been beautifully described in the book called Jaws, A Hidden Epidemic. This is a book that was written by Paul Ehrlich and Sandra Kahn, my colleagues at Stanford School of Medicine. It has an introduction and a foreword from Jared Diamond and from the great Robert Sapolsky. So some real heavy hitters on this book. What that book really describes is that whenever possible, meaning unless you're speaking or eating or you're exercising or other activities require some change in your pattern of breathing, we should really all be striving to breathe through our nose, not through our mouth. And that relates to the increased resistance to breathing through the nose we talked about earlier. Again, I'll say it a third time, that increased resistance through the nose allows you to inflate your lungs more, not less. The other thing that breathing through your nose allows you to do is it both warms and moisturizes the air that you bring into your lungs, which is more favorable for lung health than breathing through the mouth. Hard breathing through the mouth or simply mouth breathing at all is actually quite damaging or can be, I should say, quite damaging to some of the respiratory functions of your lungs. That of course does not mean that you shouldn't breathe hard through your mouth when you're running or sprinting or exercising hard, but you don't want mouth breathing to be the chronic default pattern that you follow. Nasal breathing is the best pattern of breathing to follow as a default state. Another aspect of nasal breathing that's really beneficial is that the gas, nitric oxide, is actually created in the nasal passages. It's a gas that can cause relaxation of the smooth muscles that relate to the vasculature, not just of your nose, but of your brain and for all the tissues of your body. This is why nasal breathing and not mouth breathing is great for when you want to relieve congestion. So a lot of these things seem counterintuitive, right? Your nose is stuffed, so uh, that mainly makes people breathe through their mouth, but it turns out that breathing through your nose will allow some dilation of the vasculature, more blood flow, dilation of the nasal passages, and delivery of nitric oxide to all the tissues of your body. And that dilation of the small capillaries that innervate essentially every organ of your body allow the delivery of more nutrients and the removal of carbon dioxide and other waste products from those tissues more readily than if you're not getting enough, uh, excuse me, nitric oxide into your system. Okay, so a lot of reasons to be a nasal breather. If you want to check out that book, Jaws, uh, Hidden Epidemics, a terrific read. And it also shows some absolutely striking pictures, twin studies and so forth, and some before and afters of people and the aesthetic changes that they experienced when they shifted from being a mouth breather to a nose breather. These are striking examples that have been observed over and over again. When people mouth breathe, there's an, an elongation of the jaw, droopiness of the, of the eyelids, and the entire jaw structure really changes in ways that are not aesthetically favorable. Fortunately, when people switch to becoming nasal breathers, and of course that takes some encouragement either by mouth taping or doing their cardiovascular exercise with mouth closed, or by doing the sorts of exercises that we talked about earlier, when they switch to becoming nasal breathers by default, the aesthetic changes that occur are very dramatic and very favorable, including you know, sort of elevation of, of the eyebrows, not, not in an artificial sense or in a kind of outrageous way, but elevation of the cheekbones, sharpening of the jaw, and most notably improvements of the teeth and the entire jaw structure. You should be able to close your mouth and breathe only through your nose, Again, this is at rest, not during exercise necessarily. You might do it during exercise. But close your mouth, put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, and it should fit behind your teeth. And you should be able to nose breathe in that position. And many people won't be able to do that. But fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, if you nasal breathe, that is you deliberately nasal breathe when at rest for some period of time, you will experience an increased ability to nasal breathe. And you should also experience some addition of space within the palate of your mouth to allow your tongue to sit more completely on the roof of your mouth. This is especially true for children that perform this technique. Again, I refer you to the book Jaws, A Hidden Epidemic. It's an absolutely spectacular book. You can also just um, look online before and after Jaws, Hidden Epidemic, and look at some of the changes in facial structure that occur when people move from mouth to nasal breathing, and it's really quite striking. 